Welcome everyone to another Voices with Raveki. Um, I, I'm really pleased about uh, this meeting today. Um, uh, James Schofield is somebody who reached out to me uh, because of Awakening from the Meeting Crisis and uh, he sent me some of his work. And part of what I want to accomplish here is get more of you to know more about his work because I think his work is important. I think it's relevant. I think he's doing some important work at integrating uh, you know, phenomenology with um, uh, process of philosophy and what I would ultimately argue is a platonic tradition and um, uh, because there's a lot of discussion about the importance of form and constraint um, and so I'm just and, and he's doing it in a way that uh, um, is I think very very rigorous very clear excellent writing and um, and so I just I, like I said, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the content of this conversation, but I uh, and I expect James uh, and I are going to talk more than once, uh, but I want more people to know about him and his work. So welcome, James. Hi, John. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real pr privilege. Um, yeah, so uh, I could begin a little bit with a background. Yeah, that would be great. <clears throat> of how I got into uh, philosophy. Yeah, so, uh, so I've, I've always been interested in uh, the nature of humanity, but I started uh, in anthropology, and right. um, uh, the questions that I was asking about uh, the dynamics of culture, and specifically um, the fruits that could come from religious beliefs and mystical practices specifically, uh, they, they really weren't uh, things that I could answer. Uh, within the methodologies of anthropology. So I've gradually moved uh, to my mind into something that was a bit more abstract away from ethnography into uh, cognitive science and psychology and um, uh, evolutionary psychological approaches to religious traditions still uh, in my master's. And uh, I was focusing on the nature of consciousness. So at Goddard College, I was uh, subjected to um, uh, embodied cognitive, cognitive science, uh, Varela's work and Thompson's work, and, right. and that really um, made a significant impact on me. Um, and uh, yeah, and gradually though, I found that um, that even uh, those traditions were insufficient to address mm -hmm. the questions that I that I had. So I moved toward um, actually philosophy of cosmology and um, the anthropic cosmological principle and. Uh, 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 and a lot of work in philosophy of physics with uh, David Bohm specifically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then tried to tie it all together in what is now my first book. Um, so uh, I'll ask you in a moment to talk about uh, a little bit about your book. Uh, but I'm interested um, because in the paper I read, the connections to um, uh, religious experience, uh, transformation, mystical experience aren't that readily apparent. Uh, but uh, do you do you think that you are working out an ontological home uh, for these experiences in a way that is now more satisfying to you? Yes, very much so. Um, it uh, gradually was pushed more to the context, more to the background of what I was doing. So initially, it was very much at the foreground because um, I was. Uh, sort of taken into philosophy by um, mystical experiences that I had. And I thought that there might be some sort of perennial overarching universal truths that could be found through uh, yeah. the, the religious traditions. And um, I found that uh, I kind of reached a dead end in transpersonal psychology. Um, I thought that that might be uh, perhaps some of the most rigorous ways that are available now uh, to, to really work out um, systematically, like that, the structure of the soul, if there is such a thing. And, and I found that that, that just wasn't really um, satisfying for, for what I was trying to do. So gradually, um, I've, in moving my attention to uh, philosophy of physics and philosophy of biology, and um, trying to find uh, common threads of evolution and process, uh, I, I found that the issues of um, spiritual transformation were they were still present but they could be articulated in completely different ways and mm. uh, the um in a way a lot of that the paper and my book it's kind of talking around um those very issues and if someone is interested 
in them, and especially if someone has uh, studied anything about uh, mystical traditions, I think that it would be quite satisfying uh, because I'm, I'm trying to th sort of through a logic of homology, like show common structures, right, in nature and, and that, that people could recognize uh, through those traditions. Yeah, when I was reading your paper, I was, I was reminded of like John Scott as Aragina, where you're getting this very uh, sophisticated ontology, dialectical ontology <laughs> being worked out, but uh, but always in the background, of course, is uh, you know uh, a, a, a neoplatonic mystical tradition uh, of, of of you know self transcendence and transformation, and, and I really I, I, I so when I was reading your paper, I, I got the same kind of. Uh, I got the same, it, 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 it triggered that memory of me. It's like, this is, this is what it feel. I'm not saying you're saying the same things, but it was like, oh, this is what it felt to me like when I was reading Eregina or we, when I'm reading Nicholas of Cusa or some of these people, right? Uh, where, where, or, 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 you know, Plotinus, where you're getting this very penetrating ontological analysis, but it's always in this, like, it's always, you can tell that it's always in service, if not in dialogue with, you know, um, affording people, well, so it's affording what I, 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 I talk about sort of as a phenomenological ontology of intelligibility. Um, and, and so that they can make sense of these experience, uh, these experiences and transformations and how these experiences and transformations uh, call to them or claim to be disclosing reality to them in some important uh, way, like the really real and things like that. And so I got that sense when I was reading your paper um, That's good. That's something I was kind of going for. I actually read Nicholas of Cusa first. I first came to him at the same time that I first came to Harris's work. The, the, the oh. two books were, were given to me um, uh, as introductory texts to a philosophy class, my very first philosophy <laughs> class, which now I find completely ridiculous. Right? <laughs> yeah, because it, it took say. me years to get through them, <laughs> and then it ended up being the, the cornerstone of my uh, doctoral thesis. <laughs> So uh, yeah, that was hard. that was a hard class. <laughs> um, I can imagine. Uh, and so yeah, uh, and I I um, I suppose that that that's that, that's really where I would like to start. Um, and but let me lay maybe one more background uh, a plank down for uh, for us, because um, this was also apparent in your paper. You're you're deeply influenced, uh, especially by Evan, Evan Thompson's work. I can see that it's coming through, as am I and Varela and mm -hmm. the four four e cognitive science. But in a way uh, that I think feels similar to me, uh, to I mean to the work that I'm doing. I, like I, I want to go beyond that. So I, I find myself both reaching back to Marlo Ponti and the phenomenological tradition, and then also reaching out or back <laughs> to the Neoplatonic tradition on one hand, Whitehead on another to try and get at a more fundamental picture. Um, and part of my reason is, uh, is that I want a more adequate you know, framework and ontology just for its own sake. But part of it is, um, you know, I've been th three decades as a practitioner of a lot of transformative practices. I was just in a discussion with you know, another group of people there putting together a, what's called a monastic academy a secular academy their ecology of practices and right and so uh, trying uh, I, i'm trying to do an ontology that's not only sort of satisfying as an ontology whatever that might mean uh but it but also that can bridge between the scientific world and the spiritual world in a way that is respectful to both of them yeah you know, and, and i i have a sense and i need to read more of your work and uh, but I have a sense that your work could be, you know, important in that task, in that endeavor. Is that a fair, a fair thing to de yes. demand from your work, or am I being unfair to you? No, that, that's that's. Uh, I agree very much. So I have very much appreciated uh, listening to and looking at a lot of your videos, and I've found that a lot of my work resonates with what yeah. you're doing, yeah. the very point of it, and. Um, uh, one thing that you have pointed out that isn't often pointed out is just the how impoverished we are with our ontological understandings, yeah. especially in psychology. And yes, uh, I, it, that's one of the main motivations for my work. And I think that 
uh, ontological argument that is um, very much rigorous along the same lines of current metaphysics, analytic metaphysics, um, can be made uh, uh, through a phenomenological methodology. Yes. That's actually the, the specific angle that I'm taking. And one of the implications of that is that um, uh, there should be a kind of continuity between the process of living and growing and self-reflecting uh, that that is informed by uh, the like a more accurate ontology of, of our nature and uh, our understanding of nature itself. And to put that another way, our development should be continuous with evolution going yes. back through evolution and into cosmology. And uh, this is a contention that has made a lot of um, for e cognitive scientists a bit wary. Uh, yes. And it's where uh, I have had occasion to bring in um, uh, appeals to philosophy of physics, which um, of course, cognitive scientists are doing great uh, philosophical work in, uh, in dealing with the arguments of cognitive science uh, and philosophers of mine likewise. But one of my concerns is that um, it, can't be done. The, the the work that they're trying to do, the questions they're trying to answer, uh, can't be uh, satis satisfied um, without actually connecting in a in a much broader interdisciplinary way. Yeah, uh, and and this has significant implications for um, education, right? So, so the very conception of growth, like how we go about learning, um, it connects to. Uh, the, the process by which we engage in interdisciplinary work. And to my mind, that is um, uh, going to give us a framework for understanding our spirituality, is, is seeing the way that we grow. Uh, and, and it will be continuous with the, the very process of cognitive um, development, uh, going back to uh, single-celled organisms, how they have undergone the process of, uh, of adaptation and self-transcendence. That's amazing. I mean, there's so much resonates. I mean, uh, that's sort of that trying to get that connection is at the heart of uh, the work I do on relevance realization. I just finished a series with uh, Greg Enriquez and Zachary Stein called Towards a Metapsychology That is True to Transformation. I want to get you talking to Greg. I want to get you that's talking to Zach. Um, I think uh, everything you just said about education, Zach Stein would be just like, yes. I, I watched all of that. Yeah, so I, mean, <laughs> I really like it. I want, I want to get you into conversation with both of them. I I, uh, I think though they, they will love it. So, uh, I mean, I I had similar sort of things. I remember, you know, when I was first diving deep into trying to explicate and articulate, you know, uh, Evan Thompson's deep continuity hypothesis. I, I realized that you, you know the principles were not as bounded. Like, there's no reason why you won't get something like you know the Neoplatonic uh, continuity, uh, where, where, like you said, where you there's like there's there, there's reasons for why the principles have a deeper continuity down and perhaps even up uh, than are uh, that are typically talked about in for e cognitive science. Now, there has been some movement up in that. Uh, there's work. Now, serious work about extended mind and distributed cognition is starting to come in. Um, but yeah, there's an unwillingness uh, to, a, 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 and I don't know if it's unwillingness, that may be too harsh, but there, there's a neglect of trying to get to a fundamental ontology out of this in some ways. Although, you know, to be fair, Evan does pursue ontology. So instead of talking about this, um, Sort of from the outside. Let's try. Let's try this. Um, I think we framed it well. That mm -hmm. right. That there's a deep. There's a deep need to get um, some a, a form of, of of theoretical discourse that bridges between the depths of our uh, our spirituality and our deepest understanding of reality. Mm -hmm. And while for e cognitive science sits, I think, in that project. Um, you and I are both agree that it needs to perhaps it needs to be extended um, in a profound way, and that's what you're doing. and And you're making use of Harris's work. And until you mentioned him, I had not heard of Harris. Right. Which I, which, you're not which, alone there. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, and and now, like I mentioned before we started recording, I, I'm buying Harris's book. And I've got mm -hmm. your book. I've got your paper. Um, so this like you're not going to be able to do it all because your work is like like, like 
but like where like at least let's get started what yep. how like what is, what is it you're bringing that is what's the problem um with doing what we've all what we're talking about to get this bridging going what are some of the fundamental problems um how do you how are you making use of paris and uh, uh, uh you know a reinterpretation of certain uh aspects of phenomenology uh mm -hmm. to try and address the problem and 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 ultimately i hope we get to how does that connect up to you know things like the meaning crisis and some of the work i've been doing we don't have to get right, there right, right away it does right? it does connect in it does I, 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 get that. Crisis. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that uh so there's in the very beginning there's an articulation uh by harris uh, it's his line of argument and uh, he begins with the uh, at least logically not chronologically he begins with the idea of um uh, what are the conditions of having uh, synthetic a priori. So any kind of understanding of um, the basic structures of, uh, of phenomenology, um, independent of looking at the world, uh, that actually give us insight into the nature of the world itself. And he starts with the concept of wholeness. Um, and uh, this, this appears very much as a kind of meditation. And um, it, he runs through a number of uh, axioms, basic um, uh, assumptions that need to be made uh, in order to have any kind of discussion at all about anything that would arise in phenomenology. So, so what he's doing is, is very much in the tradition of Descartes and Husserl, um, but, uh, but he, and it interfaces a lot with, with Kant, of course, but um, he tries to get past um, Kant's divide between the phenomenal and the noumenal. Um, ultimately, that's where he's headed. And uh, he, he does that through a, a line of argument that I just haven't seen um, anyone uh, else make. Uh, well, uh, to some degree, Taylor de Chardin has, has done this and, and Whitehead, uh, various uh, individuals have tried, but, but he ends up in a very different uh, line of reasoning. So, um, uh, so wholeness, right, in the beginning, um, it, he adds to that the claim that uh, there must be um, dialectical relations, right? So whatever it is that occurs um, is going to be uh, arising very much along the lines of a, a, a Buddhist epistemology of um, uh, interdependent co-arising, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's essentially what dialectical relations is. Uh, and uh, through a very long line of argument, he, he shows that um, in physics, there's uh, examples uh, where this kind of dialectical relation is actually fundamental to uh, the phenomena that's actually arising. Um, so it's something that we seem to have support for it being uh, an empirical reality, right? Uh, and, and then he runs through biology and he ends up saying something similar for the nature of a self-organizing system. And in doing so, he's anticipating autopoiesis. His, his argument for it is, is uncanny. It's absolutely spot on to what ends up being said by Varela in the 70s. But he, he makes this argument from metaphysics to cosmology to uh, biology to cognitive science um, in 1965. And that's what I found um, very useful. And he did that uh, prior to knowing Bohm's argument, and essentially it also anticipates Bohm's conception of the implicate and explicate orders. Uh, so in the end, <laughs> this is a very kind of overview of it, right? We can go back into details if you'd like, but in the end, he ends up positing a um, coherence theory of, of, of epistemology. And I think this is where um, we can see uh, an interface of, uh, of ethics and epistemology, right? Where uh, we, we have an obligation to, uh, in a pragmatic sense, take into account as many perspectives as we can and try to uh, synthesize them, try to bring about a kind of binocular convergence across individuals. And so this appears as a kind of empathy for our practices of engaging with one another. Right. Uh, it also appears as a kind of symbiogenesis uh, when, you, when you look at it in the, in the case of biology. Uh, right. And you can see that that kind of evolution on a collective scale for into, for people in, uh, in, in different um, uh, organizational spheres appears as uh, interdisciplinary dialogue in, yeah. in the case of societal organization, right? So there's, <laughs> uh, from this ontology, you end up with uh, a series of arguments that are uh, basically 
homologously mapping on to specific theories in physics, biology, and cognitive science, uh, and then giving rise to uh, an ethics and an epistemology. Uh, very, very quick overview That's a very, <laughs> of yeah, the entire thing. Yeah. So, so let's, uh, and that was excellent, by the way. So, so let's try and uh, uh, let's, let's do it again, uh, not because of redundancy, but what, let, let's try and do it and, uh, uh, and we'll have to work together on this too and try and not rely too much on uh, specialized jargon. Um, sure. And uh, not because what you said wasn't coherent and clear, it was, but I, I, I ultimately want to make the case that we started with that right are part of addressing the meaning crisis and affording people the transformations that they're seeking and hungry for is that we have to address the fact that we have an impoverished ontology that can't afford us doing that and so i want to take the work you're doing and the work you're doing with harris's work and try and get it where people um could see how it could be relevant to them um so the way I heard you saying is Harris is, you know, he's starting, he's starting from this place where he's trying to look at, uh, you know, one of the things that is in the key of, you know, phenomenology is how, how we're making, how we make sense. And this is, of course, a fundamental term in Evan's work and Varela's, you know, sense making and to pay very careful attention to what are the conditions of sense making. And then I, I saw you um, and, and, and you, you, you're doing it on behalf of Harris making this move, which Gerson talks about is a fundamental difference. So in Cartesian, the Cartesian approach, you sort of start here and work out. Um, and what Gerson says in ancient epistemology, you take it that intelligibility is um, as neutrally as possible. And then you try and ask, what does the world, what, 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 what must the world be like such that this is possible? Yep. Right. And so what I see you doing is I see you trying to do that what must the world be like such that there's intelligibility here mm -hmm. but also what must the mind be like right such that like i see you trying to move from both poles yep. right right that's what's i think interesting i, I mean yeah harris isn't uh, unique in this way but i guess the way he runs with it is somewhat unique and it is that he's working simultaneously from sort of the inside out and the outside in exactly uh, of phenomenology and and in doing so he's articulating the structure of phenomenology and, and sort of the the limitations for our different modes of reasoning and and how we can reason our ways into corners and such and one of the main like this is this is quite important for uh, a lot of discussions in um, religion and in politics actually as well and in ethics is uh, showing the space of discussion such that um, you can see when we get into the stratosphere of metaphysical discussions and you can see kind of uh, how we are um, creating our, our own cage in a way um, yeah. specifically that. Uh, some of the most fundamental assumptions, right, is that the world needs to be um, whole and uh, we need to be able to cognize that in some manner. Um, and so the, the, the horizon of our phenomenology uh, is coincident with the horizon of the world, right? And that then gives rise to certain ways of conceptualizing the world that we're in, uh, the, the way that we posit that horizon. Um, and there's, I think often in actually in professional cosmology, even there's conflations between the way the, uh, the form of this horizon is discussed in a physical sense with the metaphysical sense, right? And, and yeah. to understand um, what kind of data we have available <laughs> that gives rise to the, the empirical conception and how that relates to our metaphysical conceptions, um, that at least can give us uh, a space to enter into some interesting dialogue that uh, sometimes is um, missed. And, and this is where we bump into dogma, right? Yeah. So, so understanding kind of the form of an individual's horizon and how that gives rise to our thoughts and how that guides us and how we're going about our lives, right? Um, that's a very basic uh, contribution of a phenomenological methodology, but it's also relevant even in the case of particle physics and, and cosmology and, and of course, in every other discipline. Right. That, so I think that's very, very important what you just said. 
right? And, and trying to avoid that conflation. It, it, so let's try and do that. Let's like, let's really, so there, there are different dependency relations that we're noting when we're trying to get at the int intelligibility. And this comes out in your work uh, mm -hmm. and, you just and you just invoked it with the horizon. Um, there's, it, there's a sense in which all intelligibility, and we'll work out what these senses are in a sec, but all, all intelligibility depends on my conscious experience, right? And, and, and then, and one danger that phenomenology is sometimes facing, and you bring it as up in your paper, is trying to escape sort of out of a kind of subjective idealism, because um, you can get locked into, well, you can say, you know, that means the world and existence and being are dependent on my conscious consciousness, and, 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 and you, can, you can speak that in an unlimited fashion. Um, because there's another sense in which, right, your phenomenology tells you, you know, and Heidegger made this, you know, that, the, the, you know, that uh, our consciousness is dependent on a world, uh, that, right, that, is, that gives to us things uh, uh, in, in, in various ways. Um, and so you have the, the fact that, if I'll, I'll use the metaphors that we were using a minute ago, from the inside, the world seems to, to depend on my consciousness. And from the outside, my consciousness seems to depend on the world. And then we've tried various reductive strategies with saying one of those is true and the other is false. And we bet or and we bank and one of the things I see you doing, you know, I maybe I'm getting it wrong, but I see you trying to get no, no, there's a way in which we have to hold these both true. And mm -hmm. that and that is actually fundamental to our ontology. The, the one thing our ontology has to do is both of these. Yes. True. Is that a fair is that a fair take? Yes, yes, that, that's incredibly important, actually. Thank you for bringing that up. That, that gives me some traction for, for where to head next. Um, yeah. So uh, one of the main moves that comes out of this that I think is uh, somewhat uh, novel, at least for current discussions in phenomenological ontology, is the appeal to neutral monism. Um, yes. There's there's a number of important reasons for that. And this is, I'm super curious to know how you uh, react to this, because you, you appeal to neo Platonism, uh, right. you know, Platonic tradition, and, and uh, I'm not exactly sure how we relate on these issues, but uh, but very, and, and it would help me to work out a lot of. But but I also well, appeal but... to to Nishitani, right? And Nishitani mm -hmm. is and Nishida are deeply influenced by James's neutral monism. So the mm -hmm. Kyoto School, um, right. so and trying to get those two to talk together is part of what I'm uh, I'm working on. But go ahead. Yeah. So, so yes, this is this is uh, incredibly important because um, what it allows us to do is to say that whatever uh, sort of unifying principles, as Harris would call them, or, yeah. or structures um, or holes, gestalts that we come yeah. up with that map yeah. onto the world, they are not the world, but they are um, partial reflections of it, right? So our mathematics are not like the scaffolding of nature. Um, this, this is an important move uh, in this approach. And what it does, though, is it opens, uh, I, I think it provides a much more rigorous um, way to conceptualize a methodology that comes out of it. I don't think that um, other approaches are going to give this this sort of uh, conceptualization of a um, ongoing clarification, right? So what one thing that Bohm articulated, and actually uh, Thompson has this in common, and, and Harris to some degree as well, uh, is the idea of um, uh, heterarchy, right? So there, there isn't actually a fundamental level that we're trying to get at, that exactly. from which we can derive everything. Yeah, yes, um, yes. And instead, we are to look at, in a pragmatic sense, uh, the, the practices that we engage in, um, our habits of thought, and our way of mapping certain structures onto the world. And what's really quite elegant, and I think interesting about this, is that you can see it play out in physics, in the case where certain conceptions of information are taken to be uh, absolute, um, they're they're taken to be fundamental, and and <laughs> the, the scaffolding of our ontology, and uh, this is this is quite problematic for its own reasons, but um, it guides the research. Yes, right? and you can much. see this in the case also, though, of individuals who have absolutely no scientific training at all, where. 
uh, we, we listen to a song or we hear, um, we hear someone say something to us about who we are, <laughs> our identity, right? And, and we take this as a kind of guiding principle for how we understand the way that we relate to the world. Um, it sort of colors and uh, it gives us a lens through which uh, we see the world and our relationship to it. Um, and I think that uh, interestingly, this certain teachings within Buddhism that uh, have pointed out uh, at least the awareness of that process in certain contexts. And I think it can be generalized. And I also think that um, uh, neurophenomenology is one instance in one uh, area of neuroscientific and phenomenal phenomenological research that actually does this very well, where it says that um, the reality is not the uh, verbal report, the phenomenological report, or the neuroscientific report. What we have are homologous relationships, uh, right. and each one is continually clarifying the the variables and the the values and the the relations that we deem relevant in each case. It, it brings about an ongoing clarification. So that's that's what I mean by generalizing neurophenomenology. Um, it it, uh, it 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 can certainly be applied to. That, that way of thinking can be applied to uh, the whole of scientific endeavors. So, so let's do do, do that. I mean, so the, the like, the, I, I want to unpack that that mm. that movie you just made was really good, and uh, like the idea uh, um, that there is no privileged level. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it it it's not it's not forbidding talking about levels. At least I don't see that in Evans' work. Right, sure, sure. But, yeah, but it's saying. You don't privilege any level that um, they all have an equal claim on realness. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is this is a rejection of Scotus and Occam, and in a, in a profound way, uh, we're, we're rejecting Scotus's notion of the univocosity of being, and we're rejecting Occam's notion that right nominalism and that all the patterns are not real; they're just projected onto the world. All mm -hmm. that really exists are the raw individuals. These are two like sort of fundamental things that are being. Uh, challenged and I, I by the way challenged with good reason and good argument and good evidence from the practice uh, and the content of the existing sciences which is a point I think you're making mm -hmm. and just to, just to just to be clear about how that might go I, I think it's clear how that goes with Nishitani's meta his ontology because it's it's exactly that like like everything everything is present like it's uh, uh, sorry that will make it sound like indra's net what it's not but he has the circumessentiality of everything right that he's trying to get a way of talking about the what uh, an ontology of complete co-determination co-emergence would look like and so i think that meshes very well and you already alluded to uh student uh, you know uh, um, uh, certain buddhist uh, ontologies that are consonant with your work Later, Neoplatonism gets into a very similar place, which is why you see people in the Kyoto school like Suzuki uh, comparing Eckhart to Zen and things like that. Because when you get, by the time you're getting to Kuza, who is in that tradition, and Eregina, um, you've got the idea that, if you'll allow me some bottom up and top down language, the, the emergence and the emanation are as real. And they completely co-penetrate. It's not like emanation starts and then half it meets emergence. They completely interpenetrate, uh, bottom to top and top to bottom, and they're both equally important uh, for the intelligibility of reality and for reality itself. And, and so that's where I see the connection um, in in sort of the later work of people like Eregina and and Kuza, where you're trying to get and, and think about what you know Kuza and when he's to, when he when he's uh, talking in the vision of God, he, I don't know if you're familiar. But he uh, he he sends the he sends the monks with, with the treatise a, a painting, and the painting is got this. It's what it, they were very fashionable because perspective painting has just been discovered, right? And the 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 thing about these paintings is wherever you go, it looks like the painting is looking at you. The portrait is looking at you, right? And he says, so do that. But when you're over here ask your brother monk who's over here what what the what the painting is well who the painting is looking at and then he and then, he, and then you'll see and he says and he uses that to try and explain right um the proper state of mind and consciousness you need to get into in order to understand right the the, the god ultimate reality mm -hmm. um and so what that's that's 
that you might not find that convincing, but mm -hmm. my point is to try and show you that there are there are significant developments in later Neoplatonism as typified uh, by um, Eregina and Kuza that I think do line up in a lot of ways with what you're mm -hmm. talking about. And I also think it's you know that uh, it's it's fair to think of people like Spinoza and Whitehead in that tradition. Whitehead saw himself in that tradition, um, he and uh, as as a, a footnoter to Plato. And so um, I, I think, I, yeah, I, I don't think, uh, again, I might, I might, I'm not trying to convince you, I'm just trying to make it plausible to you that there are uh, real connections between what you're doing and aspects of the Neoplatonic tradition. There most certainly are. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to know how you would posit our relationship to the, the forms that we can identify. I think that's really what we've come to here. Like uh, we, we, we identify a, a system or a structure on a given scale. What is that scale? What is that form? Yeah. And, and yeah. what what's the relationship between our knowledge of it and ultimate reality, right? That's, that's the, the questions that we're trying to answer here. Yes, uh, and, and that's actually the question where the spirituality and the philosophy come together because yeah. I, I, I think that there's something to uh, the Platonic idea of a kind of knowing that's a, 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 a conformity uh, rather than a, a representation or a correspondence theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's one thing I would want to say that part of what we're doing is participating in it. Um, and, and I think this is part of what I see in the connections between your ontology and your epistemology, because what you're saying is, you know, uh, and, and what I'm saying, and then I'll ask you if that's what you're saying. What I'm saying, for example, is the principles of evolution by which we emerged as a biological species are, uh, are in deep continuity or homologous to the principles of relevance realization that are running our intelligence. So it's not just, it's not the case that our intelligence just points when it's theorizing about evolution. Mm -hmm. I would ultimately say the, the, the way, the reason ultimately why the mind uh, can, touch reality is because of a shared identity of principles or form, as you might mm -hmm. put it. And part of what we're doing, and this is the platonic idea of anamnesis, at least one interpretation, is we're bringing into awareness that conformity uh, as a way of giving us, I think that's what's behind the sense of realness um, that licenses any particular um, ontological claim we want to make. Um, and, and, and that's ultimately what I think the various reductionisms were trying to get at. By pursuing a reduction, they were trying to bring about a conformity between knowing and the structures of reality, but they were doing it in, well, a reductive way. And to get that insight, which I think is at the core of Marlo Ponti's work on realness, to get that insight and articulate it in a non-reductive way, I think that's the project that we're facing. And that's what I'm finding so exciting about your work. Now, I might, I might be misreading you, but that's what that's part of what I'm seeing. Right, there's, there's a lot there. So, um, uh, okay, so my approach or my appeal to coherence theory and my conception of the neutral, uh, the, the neutral whole of yeah. nature um, being basically a kind of fractal that we're trying to mask yes, onto yes. continually, that doesn't at all uh, refute the methodology of reduction. And in fact, reduction is, it plays an incredibly important role in uh, yeah. moving us along and bringing about greater clarity, right? Uh, the question is what forms map to what scales in what ways, right? We're continually trying to do this in better and better ways by, uh, and this is where relevance realization becomes increasingly important. We need to take into account more and more perspectives of uh, yes. a, a given phenomenon uh, so that we can clarify it and, and make sure um, in what ways it's relevant, right? Uh, so I, I very much appreciate uh, Noah Moss Brender's work uh, on symmetry breaking. I mentioned that in the paper. Yeah. Yes, um, very it, much. So he, that's, that's pretty much the strongest way of, I think, connecting the, um, the ontology and the epistemology um, that, I'm, that I'm trying to provide here of symmetry breaking, right? So what we find are um, different kinds of symmetry breaking or symmetry making processes. And uh, we, we do need to be- Let's maybe- Productive to, 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 
Uh, so uh, something. So people are, are probably going to think of this in shape, and you're actually mm -hmm. using symmetry, right? That something is symmetrical if, it, if it's unchanged under various variations, and mm -hmm. symmetry breaking is when that breaks down. So maybe unpack that a little bit, and then. Right. And right. So we can think of a, homo a, a homogeneous space um, with no differences as being absolutely symmetric symmetrical. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's an interesting argument that Harris makes that kind of uh, is at the very basis to uh, a lot of his conceptions of nature. And it's, it's the idea that um, we cannot have uh, a state of nature that's completely uh, uh, homogenous like that because um, the, the lack of difference uh, pretty much refutes any conception of there being matter like we, we can only have a conception of matter if there are uh, so if there's some form of self-differentiation um, and, and that brings us to focus on the, the whole right because the the difference at a most at the most fundamental level is a basically a function of the whole it's a it's a difference that the um, the the entire system uh, in a sense exerts on itself uh, yes. to bring about the most fundamental difference right and it's always uh, it always must be there um, and and what's more we do not have an empirical means of establishing what that is no, so this exactly. is this is to my mind a very uh, fascinating and important uh, conception and it's uh, so it's it's a way of positing a kind of um, uh, uh, phenomenological ontology that also is the ground of our conception of nature, but it's not something that's empirically known, but it, right. it's something we have to empirically uh, posit anyway on pragmatic grounds, because it's not something that's likely to change <laughs> given any further inquiry. Well, well uh, yeah, I think that's a very important point. Uh, and part of what, this is maybe an aside, but I'll just put it out there. Part of what I've been trying to advocate is that we understand by natural nature uh, or naturalism, uh, not just what is derivable from our sciences, but what is ultimately presupposed by them. Mm -hmm. And, and I, what I hear you saying and what Harris is saying is that this the, the, the presupposition of self-differentiation is fundamental both to the possibilities of knowledge and the possibilities of being. Because part of what I, I take yeah. is, I'm going to be saying is that ab, uh, there's a sense in which um, you know, absolute ho homogeneity is not different from sort of absolute chaos in, in the sense of uh, like, it, it, uh, I'm, I know there's differences in analysis, but I'm trying to get at this point that it mm -hmm. breaks the, the, it breaks the two poles, if you'll allow me, I'm trying to speak neutrally here, that we presuppose an in intelligibility, um, that knowing is possible and that there's, uh, that the world is knowable. And homogeneity smashes both of those. It, it prevents them from coming into existence. So I'm good, you're nodding, so I'm getting it right. Um, um, so what what does, so I, I think that's very important. And and then you said something before that, that I also really think is very important. And I've, I've been trying about the multi-perspectival, right, as a way. So um, it relates to the conception of scales. Uh, the idea is that- uh, so Is there a structural realism in here? Like, um, in, like right, right, so- Yes, uh, I've tried to deal with that. Okay, so um, the question is like, how how real are the structures that we posit, or that say like physics has when it yeah. says that uh, this this model of an atom or of some physical phenomenon, um, it, we can we can project it onto the world. It gives us uh, positive predictions. Um, yeah. it, it, you know, like how real can we say this thing is that we have? Uh, yes. And the I so I at this point turn to a pragmatic conception where uh, if it if if a model maps onto the world and it gives us continuous predictions in such a way that we, we can't find any way of relating to it that could possibly come up with a difference right then then we take it to be real uh, in that sense and it, it serves as a kind of guiding principle from from then on and we can say that this is uh, true of and usually this happens on certain scales right so uh, physics has its, its basic structures that it, it it projects into the world and it says like this is not likely to change right but um, the the idea is that um, the so when you begin with a self-differentiating conception of of nature uh, that is 
simultaneous with uh, the self-differentiating conception of our own phenomenological field. And yep. what both show in their evolution is uh, self-differentiation into a scale of forms. So the, the task then is to try to map out the, the different um, uh, scales, the different holes that occur. Um, because in the very beginning, it's a, it's a symmetry break that basically is a difference of um, one hole that's uh, effectively homo homogenous to um, two that is just uh, one thing relating to its uh, its symmetrical uh, partner but there's no way to posit what their relationship is unless you add uh, a, an axis and bring yeah. about a context so yeah. the context and that triadic phenomenological structure is inherent from the beginning and to my mind, there's no way to get outside of that. So it has to, for my work and for other people's work in different ways, particularly um, Hans Jenny in his uh, kinematics research, uh, he had his uh, triadic phenomenology as well. It was very similar to this. Um, it, it, this, this serves as a kind of guiding principle. So we're always um, seeing uh, the, the focal aspect, some sort of uh, kinetic uh, motion to a difference and then a context uh, that allows yeah. us to posit what that difference is. Um, and it, it, it essentially this is what we're seeing iterated throughout nature in different ways. And we're, we're trying to characterize the um, properties or the relationships that we bear to these different levels uh, of nature that are essentially right the, the continuation of this process across um, all the scales that have given rise to us. And then there's a further argument to say how it is that that process has given rise to its own self-awareness. Right. Uh, uh, there's a similar argument about that triadic structure running through Eastman's recent book, Untangling the Gordian Knot, uh, where he's trying to do something similar. Uh, so uh, another, sort of another step back. So what we've got, right, is we've got, if you'll allow me, we've got a vertical aspect where we're trying to see um, this fractal relationship, uh, uh, a real relationship, uh, pragmatic real, I, I'll get, okay, yeah. but a real relationship between these different scales. And then this is also intersecting with trying to, um, trying to explain how we can keep those two dependencies that we talked about earlier, uh, both together as real. The, the the world depends on my consciousness. My consciousness depends on the world. So could you could you clarify a little bit? Is that question making sense? Right? How, why does I mean why does finding this for Harris and for you? Why does finding this scale, which uh, right uh, of of forms, why does that help to to get past all of the knots we've always gotten into about you know, the subjective objective relation, et cetera. So I think that uh, it allows us to see uh, how it is that we're positing something to be um, coherent. Um, so one, one thing to be kept in mind is that any given, I think, uh, scale that we try to mm -hmm investigate or any given level or, or whole, uh, it, it occurs as it does because of our participation and our, our sort of yes. bringing forth an entire scale of, <laughs> of other forms, right, that, that are related to it, that, that make it appear to us the way it does. So um, I think that this uh, methodology it allows, and the ontological conception, uh, it allows us to, I think, uh, bring to light how it is that we're bringing forth the, the different gestalts that we encounter. Uh, because they they are fundamentally interconnected with uh, uh, each other, right? And the the goal I think is to um, aim toward coherence, right? So to see how um, all of the phenomena that we encounter are actually um, uh, interdependent and self uh, self organizing yeah. um, uh, along this scale, like yeah. So what what I'm hearing you say, and I thought that. Thank you, that was good. But what I'm hearing you say is something like the, the mutual constraint and constitution between these scales mm -hmm. 
is pointing to something that's ultimately more fundamental <coughs> and in terms of which <clears throat> we can explain. Sorry, I gotta take a drink here, water. <clears throat> Throat suddenly went dry, talking too much today. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm hearing you say that that getting clear about that takes us to something in terms of which we can explain intelligibility that doesn't get us into those binds that we've gotten into in the past. At least that sounds like the hope. It's like, right, so, um, it, like, like for example, yeah. someone could say, well, what you just said sounds to me like idealism, mm -hmm. like saying that it's all right. It, it depends on our participation. Well, that's just idealism. And we've done that. And, yep. here, and here's the 17 problems with idealism, mm -hmm. right? Or someone can say scales, those scales are, you're just talking about structural right, realism, so, so right? Right, the, right? The, the thing about neutral monism is that uh, we, we are continually clarifying what relationships compose the whole. So we aren't, um, I think that it's a, uh, it's a fallacy to extend our consciousness to the whole of being like this, there's just no good argument for doing that. So to extend the properties that we find of subjectivity, which aren't really things that we can explicate very well anyway, as being individual properties, they, they really aren't. Um, right. They, extending that into the, the, the whole of nature doesn't make any sense. So what we're trying to do is continually um, uh, explicate what uh, what constitutes the whole. And in doing that, we're, we're continually differentiating it because we're participating in it in different ways. So a fundamental part of this is this conception of a kind of binocular convergence that takes place through um, uh, understanding the world through others' eyes and trying to see how uh, the phenomenon in question, um, we can gain a, a, a clearer picture of it uh, by taking into account yeah. more parameters of it, basically, or um, yeah. more, more parameters of ourselves, really. So what this ends okay. up giving us is an open-ended conception of human nature. So we uh, can't actually define ourselves in relation to this neutral whole or this uh, scale of ongoing uh, forms, right, of, of form making. Um, right. What we have instead is a path of evolution. Uh, and, and it appears very much more in terms of symbiogenesis. Uh, and the, the interdisciplinary methodology that comes along with that, I think, um, is it, it's, it, that is the best that we can get for um, right. basically true. approaching science and understanding uh, our relationship to the world. So okay. the, the biggest problem with most of metaphysics up until now is the presumption that uh, for, um, basically properties or entities exist um, independent of our observing them, independent of our beholding them, right? There, there hasn't been enough attention paid to the uh, contextualizing acts that are that are taking place. So what this does is it allows us to see how uh, the, the scale of forms is essentially um, self-referential and uh, it appears like the topology of a Klein bottle. So yeah. We can't get outside of it. And when we try to talk about nature, in a sense, we're talking about our own projections onto this very process. So the process is not us. Um, it, it's not exhausted by us. We, we know that in the very conception of it being a neutral whole, right? Uh, but uh, what it is, is this ongoing evolutionary process. That's very interesting. Um, so uh, I, I like I like the the sort of creative tonos there um, that you know we, we we're 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 trying to talk about it uh, we're trying to simultaneously say like Harmon says that our experience should not be sort of half of ontology or all of ontology but nevertheless we're not trying to absent ourselves from that ontology either right, right. Um, the objectivity can't be yeah. that um, yeah. complete objectivity it's a continuous objective making I think yes we're we're, we're continually making ourselves. Uh, more and more acquiring a kind of God's eye view, but it can't be achieved. Um, right. But it, it's a trajectory, right? And that trajectory, trajectory though, yeah. is, to my mind, continuous with um, nature itself, with the very process of nature. So this is where I get into my positive uh, uh, of teleology. So the telos in 
humans and in consciousness, I think is a continuation of a telos that's in all of biology and the self-organization of the universe. It's just a different order of it. Well, let's talk about that in a sec, but before we pick that that, that uh, the teleological thread up, I suppose there's a pun in there. Um, I wanted, to, I wanted to also emphasize a point you just made, and you've made it a couple of times, because I'm, I'm seeing now the deep connection uh, between uh, a dialogical understanding of epistemology, something that I'm arguing for, the necessity for dialogue. And I think that is, a, by the way, a platonic uh, point um, that you need to get, right? If, you're, if, if what you're pointing to as real is uh, a trajectory of, of coherence towards the whole, then you, ha you cannot have a monological frame uh, for pursuing that. You have to do it through as many uh, perspectives as possible. And then what that means, both methodologically and ethically, and I think even existentially is, and this is a problem I face as a cognitive scientist, but what is the language by which we bring about, right? And this goes back to Nicholas of Cusa. How do you get all the monks to talk to each other so that they realize, right, that they, that, that, there are these multiple perspectives, but that doesn't mean the perspectives are fragmented. It doesn't mean they're discordant. It doesn't even mean, right, that one perspective dominates or right, so all the others. This is where the point that I made about neurophenomenology and the method of homology um, identification um, it, it comes into play in an important way. So this is also how it can be extended into all sciences, but you can see this across just people using language in different ways where uh, what you're doing is you, you map out a, uh, the closest thing that you can get to a common structure. And then you begin yeah. to identify um, yeah. relationships that you yeah. are sensitive to. And in, in doing this, you continually bring about uh, more relations that maybe you weren't sensitive to before, because by looking at the situation through another person's eye, uh, and this can be anything, um, you, you gradually begin to increase your sensitivity. So this is, again, where uh, it's a, it becomes a methodology for phenomenology, where uh, we are broadening our phenomenological horizons uh, in, a, in an ongoing way by, by increasing our sensitivity to um, the ways that we relate to the world. And in doing so, we're, we're uh, sort of shaking up and um, uh, broadening our very conception of our identity. Right but also the various ways in which the world can disclose itself to us. Yes, right? yes, so we're also yes. altering the identity of the world in a profound way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Right. So, and then the idea is that this dialogical convergence coherence, right? That it gives us a trajectory of sense-making that points us to, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at, see one of the traditional problems with neutral monism, like, you know, Russell faced this is like, you have no language to talk about it in. You have, there's no way of, 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 of saying what it is. Like, and you point this out, you know, James, James named it very poorly. Uh, when, when, you know, the, 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 there's pure experience or something like that. And experience, well, that sounds like feeling, that sounds like subjectivity. And then, right. And so what I'm, what I'm hearing you say though, is that you, that this idea of uh, you know, a scale of forms and a commonality of forms across scale gives us a language by which we can coordinate all these perspectives. And in that coordination of perspectives, we start to get a sense, like, I mean, in the, I mean, the, not in the cognitive, we start to get a sense of the whole. We start to get a sense of the whole, is that right? Yes. 99% right or so. Um, the, the, the thing is that that Russell, um, he, he was making the very mistake that everyone else was making with all the other approaches to philosophy of mind, which was yeah. presuming that we could have an objective analysis of something and that that's precisely what we needed. Right. There, right. There, there is no one language that's going to give us that. There's, oh. a, there's a path, there's a trajectory of, of kind of methodology that we can articulate with better and better accuracy. So the language is continually being made as we're becoming more uh, sensitive to relationships by applying this right. homological method. <laughs> so the autopoiesis within the language is instantiating to a degree the autopoiesis we find within life and within the universe. And so it's 
that's what you mean by the process is like it's it's self-referential it's self-disclosing in an important way is is, is mm. it that we see we see in the very attempt like the very attempt to craft the language better and how it starts to like you say it starts to take on a life of its own that in and of itself also is a factor for disclosing the reality we're trying to talk about am, am i hearing yes, yes. you correctly yes exactly so the the very when we hit upon this trajectory and it's been it's it's precisely the it, it's how uh evolution has worked really well to bring yeah. about increasing complexity um i argue even before there was uh animate uh, beings right but but certainly in the case of biological evolution um and all cases of cognition uh it's it's the thread of increasing complexity that's been continuous throughout all of that uh uh, yes, so, so mostly yes, that is that is pretty much correct. Yeah. So well, uh, uh, yeah. So thank you, because uh, I think I, I'm getting a clearer picture, and now I'll let you pick up the the thread of uh, teleology that I wanted to put aside, because you also have a you have a different reading of teleology than the standard reading. To be fair, right? It's not it's not what people standardly mean when they sure. invoke teleology. Right. So the end isn't the goal it's it's not the the telos isn't an end state this is what harris said over and over since 1965 <laughs> um it's uh it, it's more like the process of a symphony being played out or the process of of the way life grows um so there's this telos and the self-organization and self-differentiation so uh it, in the case of a seed right this really gets the point across that there's something implicit within the organization of the seed and its relationship to the world. And uh, the tree is the explication of that. And this, the idea is that um, the same is true for uh, our developing psyche uh, with regard for how we interact with the environment, right? And this, this then coincides with attachment theory in interesting yeah, ways. Um, yeah. and, and the very process of like becoming aware uh, of the relationships that we have and uh, growing beyond them. So self-transcendence in all cases of cognition is, is basically that process. It's uh, it, it's there's, there's an unfolding um, that's more like a domino effect, but then it turns back on itself. And uh, that turning back on itself is an, is an iteration of the process. So, uh, uh, so to my mind- um, well, Can I try something? Nature is- See if it's that. convergent. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, sorry for interrupting, but I just, I, I want to make sure I'm staying with you, right? So, I mean, I've been making an argument and that, uh, uh, that, uh, the cognition is inherently self-organizing and it's inherently dynamical and that it functions by developing and as developing, it functions. You can't separate development and function and development and function are inherently a process of self-transcending. And it sounds to me that you're saying that, that that's kind of what you mean by teleology, that the process is autopoetic, but, but by, by being an inherently developmental self-organizing process, it's always, it's always also an inherently self-transcending process in some degree. It's a growth process in some way. Is that what you're meaning? Am, am I understanding so, so, so Just in the case of a, uh, a cognitive system, right? So we can, we can leave the idea of natural teleology for, for a moment or later. Uh, it, the um, in order to bring about an increase of complexity of cognitive functions, the system requires being able to reflect on uh, the, the limits of the at least some of the cognitive functions that it's enacting up right. to that point, and that's a kind of minimal sense of wisdom, actually, right? So, yeah, yeah. and this appears in in the case of. Um, uh, biological interactions as, as a kind of interruption uh, because the the automata <laughs> the automatic uh, reactions to the environment are insufficient right so that's where the the limitation occurs yes and, and that that limitation is basically um, when it's when a being is self-aware of that limitation that's that's essentially wisdom but it but it can occur just in the case of self-transcendence of an organism adapting to its environment and, and choosing to essentially act differently in response to stimuli in order to preserve its coherence. So, so great. I think we're, we're, we're on the same page about that. But you're proposing that that principle extends into non-animate things. That's what yeah. you said a few minutes ago. Right. I think that that principle is a continuation of a process that's 
uh, also can be identified in uh, cosmological evolution. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're, we're largely in agreement that uh, it occurs um, through an inactivist, uh, autopoietic kind of lens uh, from evolution to, to us, and, and there's an elegant uh, conceptualization of, of how we go about transcending ourselves that's, that's homologous to how biological organisms have gone about adapting and evolving. Um, so there's, there's various arguments uh, that have come out of um, uh, least action principles in physics and uh, yes. Yes. specifically in uh, Paul Davies' work as well. Uh, and uh, so I have essentially appealed to them, but uh, Harris's conception of this, he appealed to a lot of scientific work and, uh, and, and Bohm also effectively said, without stating the cosmological anthropic principle, he, he said in his own terms that uh, life is uh, implicit in the whole and it's, it's necessitated by the evolution of the system. He was a determinist. So um, at the, in the, for the simplest uh, approach to this argument, I could, I could simply appeal to, to um, Bohm's uh, implicate order and say his, his quantum mechanics effectively supports the idea that uh, uh, the, the structures and systems that we see, whenever whatever we see, they, they are uh, necessitated by the, the original conditions of the universe. And of course, that's very much, um, it ends up overlapping a lot with uh, complexity theory uh, to say that the universe is a complex self-organizing system. And so the, uh, the, the states or attractors that end up coming about were, uh, were implicit in its original initial yeah, conditions, right? right. right? Um, but, but this can also be said in, um, in, in terms of the metaphysics, the phenomenology itself that, that is put forth when you start with the whole and the, the self-differentiation. The idea is that um, we, when we go back in time, we're always required to posit a constraint in the same way that uh, an autopoietic system has a constraint, but of course, the universe isn't, so this is an important point, the universe isn't alive in the same sense that an autopoietic system is. That no. would be a mistake of categories. That, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is something that I've bumped up against a lot. And, uh, and, and of course, people have appealed to some sort of uh, pan-experientialism or pan psychism. Yes, I reject that as well. Right. Um, I don't think that the universe can be conscious in that way. Con consciousness is implicit in it as a feature of it, as, as an aspect of its self-referential, self-organizing process. Uh, the, the process unfolds though very much like um, like a seed into a tree uh, or, yeah. Right. So that brings me to another thing, which like which overlaps with um, the, the discussion of teleology, mm -hmm. which is uh, you also invoke the anthropic principle, but you do some really cool stuff with it. Uh, which is also very interesting because, uh, you know, standard uses of the anthropic principle uh, mm -hmm. often go along, you know, fatalist lines or deflationary lines. The fatalist line is the universe was somehow set up, you know, uh, for us, that's uh, leading, which I don't think is fair to the original intent of the anthropic principle. And then the other one is a deflationary count is like, well, there, all it's saying is of all the universes, right, uh, the only one there has to be, we're the one, we happen to be one in which consciousness is possible, big deal, nothing's happening. But I hear you saying something more like, again, the ancient Greek idea, no, any, any notion of reality we posit has to uh, include the very possibility of that reality being knowable. And then that brings you into what the, 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 the there has to be a real possibility of, of, of knowers and things like that. And I hear you doing something like that, which is, closer to how I've always tried to understand the at least what I thought was the original presentation of the anthropic principle. Right. Okay. So, uh, right. Um, so, yeah, the original conception was just that we look out at the universe and we see a hospitable world and uh, we, we need to ask ourselves, uh, well, what does this tell us about ourselves? What does this tell us about the world? And it's like, that the weak anthropic principle just says that, uh, uh, of course, wherever we find ourselves, we're going to look out at the world and see hospitable conditions. And this might actually give rise to certain constraints on our predictions about what the world should be because we find ourselves in a hospitable universe. So the deflationary accounts have all, uh, they usually appeal to 
uh, some version of multiverse theory. Yeah, and probably. I've yeah. Had, so, right. So what's really interesting to me is how we relate on the conception of possibility. Uh, I've had a, long, a lot of uh, time to think about this and argue with my advisors about this because they are analytic philosophers and, and we disagreed yeah. a lot. Um, so I, I, there's a number of different arguments to get to the teleological anthropic principle as Harris articulated it, this, this metaphysical is empirical. And what, one that might seem relevant right now is, uh, so it comes from the metaphor of a chess game. Uh, we, so this, this comes from Mark Lange, uh, his, his conception of, um, uh, or his book, Laws and Lawmakers, right? I found this really helpful for articulating the, the, the argument. Um, if, uh, so if a game of chess is played and um, a series of moves are made right to the end, uh, if, if, a, uh, if uh, the knight uh, or the, the, the rook and the, the king never castled, right? We, we don't know if that was possible. Um, we can think of uh, laws of nature. So I, I think that this is a good way to get at the, the issue. Um, if a law was never instantiated, um, our conception of like what its nature would be or um, uh, that basically tells us like, uh, our view of, of um, certain fundamental uh, entities, like how strong we are uh, leaning towards some kind of platonic view. So if, uh, if no castling takes place, we, we don't have enough information to know whether or not it was actually possible, right? So we, right. Could, we could say that the, uh, we can look out at the world and we can derive some uh, laws, uh, the rules of the game from what we're looking at, but those are always gonna be extrapolations beyond the empirical data, which are the actual moves that were made. Um, so following a dialectical holist approach, um, there is no room in the ontology for things that uh, don't obtain. Uh, th there's nowhere to put them. Um, the only place that they could be put is in a kind of um, abstract uh, platonic universe, right? And, and in doing so though, um, or in making this kind of, uh, this, this move, um, it, it means that, uh, that something fundamental like our existence from like a Cartesian kind of uh, first principle approach, um, it can't be uh, reduced to a conception of like it might have not occurred, which is in analytic metaphysics and in cosmology, usually the line of argument that's taken is, is just the idea that uh, under certain conditions, um, the, the universe could have been different and then we didn't, we would not have arisen. So um, there's no fundamental aspect of us uh, in our relationship to the world. But from a phenomenological perspective, that's not possible. Um, the, the things that we take, the, okay, so the entities that we individuate, we always have to bring back to the conditions of their individuation and they rest on us, right? The, the most coherent framework we have of our, uh, of our epistemology. And that, that of course rests on the, the basic structure of our phenomenology. So, we, um, so if our epistemology is some sort of guide to our ontology uh, from a phenomenological vantage point, we can't get rid of ourselves. <laughs> Right. That, that was that was a pretty rough. I didn't know that I was going to have to run through all of that, but that was my best attempt uh, off the top of my head. Well, that's that's good, James. So, I, I, yeah, there's there's a sense in which. Well, this is what I'm hearing, and it it's, might be overly simplistic because I know it's a complex argument, <clears throat> but I'm hearing, you know, there's a sense in which there's this, there's these there's binding relationships between realness intelligibility and phenomenology that means we as you said we can't be optional right in the sense that um whatever ontology we're positing we have to commit to the the, the we have to commit to something that can posit the ontology uh, right and in so doing um one of the conditions is that we have to be here in a sense, uh, right? Like, it's literally inconceivable what the ontology would be if there were no human beings, right? There's so, a sense, right, right. So in a pragmatic sense, then we're, we're basically necessitated. There's, there's like a few different arguments that bring us to that conclusion, but that, that's one of them, yeah. Yeah, 
essentially. And, and so that, uh, it's, it's strange to me that the phenomenologists haven't recognized their interface with anthropic reasoning in this very way. So I've tried to- I thought that was very that. creative. And I mean that as a compliment in, in, in your argument. I thought bringing those two together was a very, very, very powerful move. Um, because I, I, it made me sort of, it reminded me of, um, like, you know, the, the, the thing you discover as a child where, you know, you can't imagine your own death. And people say, well, of course I can. And they imagine a black sp space and you say, no, no, you're still within imagining, right? You're still, but, and so what you're trying to, what you're trying to get at is, right, that, and again, I get it. I get that you're not trying to smuggle in a sort of, sort of a crypto idealism, but you're trying to say that there are ways in which our ontology binds us into the history of the world um, in, in, in a fundamental sense. So I, I think, am I getting you correctly? Yes, yes, that is, that is correct, yeah. So at first it's just an epistemological argument. Uh, and then through a number of moves, I, uh, I bring in a kind of pragmatic line of reasoning. And I say, if we want an ontology and we're following a phenomenological methodology, and we think that pragmatism is the best way to jump from that to the ontological conclusion, yeah. uh, we, we then can't get rid of ourselves in any way. And there's no rational conception of having other worlds where we don't exist, <laughs> whether um, instead of this one or in parallel to this one, so that the other worlds don't actually bear upon our analysis of our nature. Um, all that matters is bringing about the most coherent conception of the holes and the self-organizing structures that we find in the world. That, that is our task. And everything else is basically a kind of um, logical exercise. And, and I think it's, it's somewhat of a distraction in a lot of cases. Yeah, I, I, I get that. Um, so how, how do you, so let's now bring it into something concrete. So mm. let me, uh, I, I granted, you know, in discussion, a lot of the points you're making how would you confront a scientist who says, "What? Well, what? Uh, I don't understand what you're talking about. Human beings have only existed at this point. Like, I, I want to be able to talk about the deep past where there's no human beings. I, like, what do you mean? How do, how do you put, like, how would you respond to that? Right. So, I mean, that's, uh, it's pretty straightforward to take a pragmatic approach and say that, like, uh, what is our relationship to this past, right? I mean, right. we're not removing ourselves from that. And that, that's really just phenomenological, but it's, it, you continue on with this methodology. And I think that uh, there's, there's no sense in basically trying to trick ourselves and believing that we're ever observing something without ourselves. Uh, and in doing so, we're more likely to recognize the biases that we're projecting onto the things that we're trying to ana analyze in the world. Right, right. But what so, I'm trying yeah, that was a point that I, I wanted to say a moment ago, actually, that um, the only way that we could do this is if we accounted for the constraint, um, the, the, the fundamental kind of um, bias that we're bringing about uh, in engaging with the world. And because we can't do that, then we're, we're left with this line of reasoning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that, that's why we can't uh, take ourselves out of the picture. So, yes, what? And I'm agreeing with the argument. What I'm trying to do is pull apart two things that are often conflated together. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do a phenomenological analysis between acknowledging everything you said that we can't pull ourselves out of the picture and the other picture that says, well, I didn't always exist, right? Uh, and so mm -hmm. we didn't always exist. And, and it's pretty clear to me that I didn't always exist. Did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and so yeah. You're, you're, it's clear to me that your argument is differentiating between those two Mm -hmm. uh, and they're often conflated together um, uh, in, in a confusing way. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to get you to pull them apart. And it's like, oh, okay. So in, in Harris's writing, he, he recognizes straightforwardly that uh, the, the process isn't always conscious. Uh, so that, that's the way that you can get at this notion of a world that exists outside of ourselves. So we, we can avoid solipsism and idealism uh, yeah. by, by way of appealing to this conception of neutral monism. Right. constituted by a self-organizing scale of forms because it's not conscious. Uh, and, and it, um, what you made earlier, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's essentially how that works, right? But um, th there is a question though, is like, well, when we look at the past, 
what are we looking at? Like the past where we weren't there, especially looking at the um, uh, uh, like cosmological or astronomical yeah. observations, yeah. right? The millions of years ago, prior to our existence, what what is that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That that's what you want me to answer right now is well like, the conceptualization <laughs> of, of that like the, well, there's I, so I, much I, written on that in the philosophy of science <laughs> um, the, of different philosophers who have tried to articulate that um, it's well I don't well is there a problem though like is there a problem that you identify in anything that I've said it, with regard for that I, I mean, I'm trying I'm trying to get. Uh, I'm trying to get how we could put together these two propositions that we can't remove ourselves from the ontology, but there are points where we did not exist mm -hmm. in the history of that ontology. I'm trying to get the ontological and the cosmological claims coherent together. That's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to do. Right. Uh, um, well, the, the best that I can do is the uh, line of empirical argument uh, and the metaphysical to some degree, but uh, which basically shows the it's a it's a conception of um, uh, the, the evolution of the universe that appears to be running toward uh, increasing complexity and uh, uh, self organization and a kind of uh, increase of orders of self reference, which um, essentially you can kind of decompose consciousness into these orders of self reference uh, at, at different scales. That that's essentially what makes us up to my mind is. Uh, is this continuing enfoldment of nature. Okay, so then what I hear you saying is, uh, perhaps one way you could deconflate it by putting in some, uh, uh, some qualifiers is, we've like, and, and we've, we were always implicitly here, but we weren't always consciously here. That's what I hear the distinction. There's a sense in which, right, um, that's because uh, I'm trying to get it back to the teleology. Uh, that we are always implicitly here because the universe is like is this implicate order, and we are I, we're like the seed. Like there's a sense in which the tree is not a seed, but the the tree is a, a, implicit in the tree in the seed. But nevertheless, the seed can't do things that the tree can do. I'm trying to get at like how you put the the how we were always here and the, with well, but we're not always here uh, and. Right. Well, yeah. So uh, perhaps the simplest way to do that is to uh, picture the evolution of the universe as uh, a phase space <laughs> with an attractor, and uh, the the attractor uh, runs through. Uh, given given the constraints uh, yeah, yes, that yes. the universe imposes on itself, right? There's this uh, space of states that the attractor goes through, or the the state yeah. uh, travels through, basically. Right. And there's a certain iteration uh, as it goes through. Um, these these states and uh, that essentially is what uh, we are and, and right. what life is. Right, so, that's what I'm uh, trying to get. So, I'm trying yeah, to get at the identity the, state. It's yeah. really important to posit the relationship between this the process and the constraint that uh, yeah. the the system imposes on itself. Uh, that's that's essentially how that works. Right, that's cool. I, I think I'm I, the, what you just did there was yeah we are that is mm -hmm. I'm trying to get the identity statement. I'm trying to get, mm -hmm. like, I'm trying to do a Heideggerian thing. I'm trying to get how, right, the ontology comes into the existential structures, mm -hmm. right? I'm trying to get at, like, um, what does it, like, what does it mean? And I, I get what you're saying. Given these constraints, we are, we are that trajectory, but that doesn't mean the trajectory is me. There's a category mistake that I'm trying to help us mm -hmm. avoid, right? Yes, uh, that's yes, my, certainly. Right. right. There's an asymmetry. There's an asymmetric. There's an asymmetric dependence in the identity statements that are being made. Right. Mm -hmm. I can say right that uh, the, 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 that right like like you said the, 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 that trajectory is me, but that doesn't or or right. But I'm not it. Or something mm -hmm. like that. I'm trying to get that. Uh, I, I my identity is dependent on it, but its identity is not dependent on me as an identity. Do you understand what I'm trying to get at? I'm trying to get at, because uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to get at a simplest. I'm trying to break out of a way in which I can hear people responding to this and saying, like you know, a new agey kind of thing. I am the universe, and that's what he's saying. That's what he's mm -hmm. saying. he's saying. I'm the universe, and I always knew it. And it's like that's not. I, I, the result of the process, and we're necessitated by the conditions of the process. Right. right. Uh, and, uh, the, and that process hasn't stopped. It's still within you. 
That's the point I hear you saying. It's not like the process is, it's, like, it's not like a Newtonian you know, billiard ball model, right? The process is still ongoing in the universe and in you right now. It, that's the thing is properly understood. Uh, this this process is continuous with evolution and with our own development. And, and yes. when you when we can understand, uh, and this is why homology is important, is because uh, when we see our own kind of self transcendence, we can we can see ourselves in the, the processes of the universe in a certain sense. Uh, and and also um, it gives us a clear sense of our trajectory of development into the future. Right. Uh, right. I, I would like to think so anyway. That's that's what my uh, oh, I, I, work I, I, that's right. I, 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 I get what you're doing. And, and I'm sorry if I've been uh, sort of clumsy, but I'm trying to press on this because I'm trying to get uh, like part of what I'm trying to understand, because this carries into spiritual practice, are the different ways in which identification occurs. And I mean it both in the sense of individuation. And when we talk about like an attachment theory or other things, when we identify with something, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get like I'm trying to get a clear picture of all of these ways of identification and get them distinct from each other and related to each other to avoid confusion and conflation. That's why I'm sort of pressing you on this point. I'm trying to I'm trying to say, can we use this ontology if we get it clear to give us guidance on how we can be careful about not making category mistakes as we are making identification and identity claims? That's what I was trying to. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yes, that, that's something that uh, has been concerning to me as well, because I've seen a lot of uh, pseudoscience, a lot of uh, a lot of just bad philosophy as well that I've uh, tried to avoid. And yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. panpsychism is uh, one position, I think, that uh, is something that uh, it, I, I come up against it in um, surprisingly uncomfortable ways. Uh, I've tried to avoid it quite a lot. Uh, and, and also, it's like, what what is the sort of power of our observation, right? Because in a lot of what we're saying, uh, it seems like we are constructing the world, right? And there's, there's, yeah. there's also the participatory anthropic principle, which says yeah. that, um, you know, observation plays the key role in quantum mechanics. And, and uh, I, I definitely uh, argue against all of that yeah. um, in, in various ways that I could take up uh, perhaps another time. <laughs> yeah, well, well it's yeah. Like, yeah, maybe we should do one on your take on uh, 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 sort of ways in which people, because like people often now, it's frequent uh, to try to derive a kind of idealism from quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. I see this happening all the time. I'd like to it's hear very, what you very have. Problematic. To, yeah, yeah, and that's <laughs> so. Yeah, and, yeah, so a lot of why I like Bohm. Uh, I appeal to Bohm for a lot of these uh, points because he's the, he's the strongest um, scientific. Uh, theoretical uh, alignment that I have um, that, that is rooted in uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, and and it, it, I think it's the best conception of, of nature or, or of like matter that we can really have uh, at, a, at a basic level. Uh, and yeah, this, this notion of like the problems with that uh, coming to a final theory and uh, his conception also, he had a whole, um, uh, in his thought as a system, it was basically a phenomenology, and, and he had his uh, line of argument for um, uh, for for individuation that he called uh, levation uh, as as a key aspect of our scientific practices, and um, so I think a lot of that helps quite a lot. And, and ultimately, his ontology was as neutral, monist in its conception. But yeah, I've heard people say. That. <laughs> Yeah, so, which which I really appreciate it, and I've tried to tie that into uh, an activist and such. Um, and and of course that provides a kind of um, anvil on which to bash uh, claims of idealism because um, because he certainly was far from that as well. And he also, I mean, he also wrote on dialogue. He was one of the first people. Yes, yes that's the that's exactly right. Like I've lately he, he been finding a lot of great kind of ontology. Part, oh, sorry, I'm talking over you. Um, is the, the connections to your work uh, with his thought as a system yeah. uh, is, is wonderful and dialogue, yeah. So I think this is a good place to stop for now, James. I'd like you to come back and, uh, um, and you know, it, I, I'd be interested to see some of the comments we get and then let's, <laughs> let's, uh, uh, let's, let's keep going because uh, uh, I'm very intrigued uh, by the proposal uh, this is one of the best presentations, uh, other than perhaps Spinoza, uh, of, of a neutral monism that I've seen in a long time. Um, I was always, I always wanted James's to work, and but I always found it. And then when I read Nishida, uh, The Experience of the Good, right? And I, I, again, 
Nishitani to me is one of the uh, one of the best ones too. Um, and so I want to talk to you at some point about what that means uh, with you know with respect to um, some of the central uh, you know things within Bori cognitive sciences, the idea of affordances, the idea of an umwelt, uh, the idea of what I call transjectivity. How does that how does that link up or not link up with what you're talking right, about? Right, right. All of that would be really great. I've uh, had a lot of interesting uh, thoughts and inspiration from uh, so many of the ideas that you've brought up. And uh, I think that uh, I'm kind of working in the clouds and a lot of your work is, is uh, it's connecting to a lot of practical matters that I um, have started to, uh, to, to sort of derive answers for. And um, it, it, yeah, and it's been nice to look at your work for that reason and to, to develop that further. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I feel that I want to return the compliment. I think you, I mean, uh, you're, you're bringing a clarity and rigor to the ontology that, you know, I'm, I feel like I've, I've been, I've been working and trying to get at an ontology of intelligibility. I'm trying to do an ontology of intelligibility and a phenomenology of intelligibility, and then integrate them together. Um, and I found, I'm finding your work already, and the discussion is was very helpful. I learned a lot in it. I'm finding it tremendously helpful at bringing a kind of uh, a rigor to that project. So I want to keep doing this. I want to keep. Thank you. That's precisely my goal. Yeah, but which is excellent. Um, so let let's uh, uh, let's. I always like to give people when I'm talking with the final word before I just thank them and we close off. Is there anything <laughs> like that you'd like to say? Uh, it doesn't have to be summative or cumulative or anything. It's just like just where you're landing right now and anything you'd like to leave people with, anything that feels it's like a little bit a thread that you just want to give a little bit more to before we um, close. Yes. So the I think that perhaps one of the strongest connections between our, our two projects, our two approaches uh, is in uh, dialogue and in education and kind of the continuation yeah. of yeah. Um, the yeah. human potential. And um, I'm just very interested to see how that can develop further uh, by talking yeah. to yourself and to others that you've been talking to. I agree. I, that's the, the and that, that's why I mentioned the bone thing too, because I see your ontology, especially the way you read the anthropic principle and other things. I see it as doing something like I see in Aerogena that we're, we're dialogue, dialogus and dialectic are not just methods or, or things, they're, 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 they're more fundamental. They put us into uh, the right relationship with sort of the deepest aspects of our ontology. I see your ontology, if you will allow me, it's not a logical implication, but you know what I mean? I see your ontology implying dia a dialogical epistemology. And I see your ontology yeah. also. Yeah, yes, <laughs> I yes. I think that it does. I, I, what, to my mind, it's an extension of symbiogenesis. It's exactly the process that, that gives rise to complexity in biology, but but in a context of cognition. Well, yeah. Well, so so let, yeah, let's talk about that next time. But uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, James. And I look forward to our next time together. Thank you.